Alrighty, folks, today I'm going to be tortured by my producers with a bunch of haters on TikTok. And I'm very curious to see how much they hate me and why. Oh, deja vu. Tick, 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 tock. Y'all seem to love these videos where I debunk Ben Shapiro's most used talking points, so let's keep it going. People who are at the top of the income bracket in the United States, the top quintile essentially pays all net taxes in the United States. Ben loves to claim that poor people should actually be paying more in taxes because the majority of total tax revenue comes from wealthy people. But that falls apart under the slightest scrutiny because the top 1% of Americans have more wealth than the bottom 90%. Wow. You might not know this, but inequality in this country is so bad that the bottom 50% of Americans control only 2% of total wealth. I can't believe that. Of course the poor middle classes don't pay the majority of tax revenue. They don't have the majority of money, or even close to it. Enough to get me to the boiling point. So next time you find yourself in an argument with your local Ben Shapiro fan, you can show him this video and remind them that talking fast does not make you right. No, what makes you right is being right. What I said in that video is that the top income quintile pays all net taxes in the United States. That is true. There's nothing rebuttable about that. That is a fact. Okay, the reason that is a fact is because the top quintile pays a broad majority of taxes in the United States and receives no benefits from the federal government. Everybody else receives benefits from the federal government that outweigh the amount of taxes they pay. So then he makes an extrapolation in this video. He says that I'm saying that people at the bottom of the spectrum should be paying more in taxes. Ben loves to claim that poor people should actually be paying more in taxes. No, what I'm actually saying is that people at the top of the spectrum should be paying less in taxes. Everybody should be paying less in taxes, particularly people at the top, because they're paying pretty much all the taxes. Everyone! As far as his argument, that there is great wealth disparity in the country. Notice how he equates wealth and income. We don't pay wealth taxes in the United States. We pay income taxes in the United States. The fact is that people at the top of the income spectrum in the United States pay as a percentage more in tax than they earn as a percentage in terms of total income. He's got you there, big guy. <coughs> so, yeah, no, it's not about talking fast. It's about knowing things. So Ben Shapiro spent his morning after Christmas complaining about the movie Glass Onion, which personally I thought was amazing. No way! But Ben Shapiro did not feel the same way. He said it is actively bad. But why does he think it's bad? Well, Ben Shapiro says that the movie is a misdirect and that he was actively deceived by the writer. <laughs> ben, that is the point of a mystery movie. But the fact that he was genuinely angry that he was misled by a mystery movie and a whodunit is just, uh, it's peak Ben Shapiro, I'm sorry. No, the idea is that in a mystery movie, they leave you the clues so that if you were smart, you could figure out what they are doing. If I make a movie in which the first half of the movie happens and then halfway through the movie, I say it, it was, was all, all a, dream. a dream. And then I proceed to tell you a second story that is completely different from the first half of the story. The first half of the story is irrelevant. That was my point about Glass Onion. They literally introduce a character who did not exist in the second half of the movie, and she is the main character in the first half of the movie. There are no actual clues to demonstrate this person even existed in the first half of the movie. So my irritation is, as an audience member, if you're showing me a mystery, the idea is you have to out-clever me. Because there's a difference between out-clevering me and lying. What I object to about the script is that it's lazy. It's actually a super lazy script, the Glass Onion script. What up, Mr. Shapiro? Uh, the right side of history is the most morally idiotic phrase of modern times. Peculiar. I sure hope you don't write a book called The Right Side of History. Thanks for entirely missing the point, dude. There you go. Okay, you notice what the, the second part of that is? History is not God and has no morality. But what if I wrote an entire book about why God is present in history from a moral perspective and how that has given history meaning? What if the entire title of the book is a flip on that tweet about how the left says that there, there is a right side of history by appealing to no moral arbiter other than the vague idea of progress. But if you actually view history through the lens of a godly universe, then suddenly history starts to make sense. What, what, if, I, what if I knew that the whole time? twist ending. Imagine that you go to a coffee shop and you open up your laptop and you're trying to read something good from Daily Wire and then you feel like, I gotta hit the restroom. So you head on over to the restroom. When you come back out, one of these crazy people is just browsing through all of your material and leaving bad TikTok videos of themselves. That'd be horrifying, right? Well, why exactly would you give anyone control of your laptop, of your internet, of your data? You should not. This is why you should do what I do and you should use ExpressVPN. Every time you connect to an unencrypted network, one of these weirdos could actually be grabbing your personal data. 
It doesn't take a genius to hack somebody. It took a genius to hack somebody. None of these people could do it, but it doesn't take a genius. All you need is the cheap hardware, and I use ExpressVPN to protect myself. ExpressVPN creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet, so hackers can't steal your data. It'll take a hacker with a supercomputer over a billion years to get past that ExpressVPN encryption. I love ExpressVPN. It's incredibly easy to use. You know, I don't have to be super tech savvy in order to make it work. I hit one button, it downloads. I hit another button, it's good to go. Secure your online data today. Visit expressvpn.com slash benyt. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash benyt. Get three extra months for free. Expressvpn.com slash benyt. Ben Shapiro wants to promote a culture of censoriousness, a gag culture, where he tries to alienate and ostracize those who go against the standard pro-Israeli narrative. Mm. And it's really ironic that he, of all people, does this being a spokesperson for neoconservatives, using freedom of speech as some kind of pretext for refuting the transgenders and the feminists and others on the left. But when it comes to the state of Israel, he acts just like those people who he criticizes. He starts labeling people as anti-Semitic. In fact, he tries to confuse and conflate anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism. Okay, so censoriousness would be, be saying, would, would be me saying that people like this should be banned from the internet. Get out! Get out! Get the hell out of here! Which I have never done. As far as conflating anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism, anti-Zionism is the idea that there should not be and cannot be a Jewish state and treating the Jewish state differently than you would any other state. It is a form of anti-Semitism. And you can see this because the crossover between anti-Semites and anti-Zionists is like 100%. percent identical. When you say there should not be a Jewish state, which is like a hallmark of the Bible and a hallmark of Judaism, and when you treat the Jewish state differently than any other state on earth, at the same exact time, by the way, that you are advocate, you've never advocated for an end to Islamic states, I would assume, then yeah, that's a double standard that amounts to anti-Semitism. Cool it with the anti-Semitic remarks. But as far as the notion that that's censorious in some way, like... I'm answering you. I'm not calling for you to be banned, I noticed. I don't know why liberals run from like these like fact-based arguments. When we're arguing about like climate change, when we're arguing about, yeah. you know, like monetary policy, well, like we're arguing these things. Like the conservatives don't have the data on any of these answers. The conservatives don't have yeah. the facts. Yeah, yeah. But somehow the conservatives became the party of like, your feelings don't care about my facts, yeah. your facts don't care about feelings. Like, well, dude, all of your arguments are either like theologically based or just based yeah. on like, this is what my small yeah. conservative community feels. How do we lose that? Well, because what you're saying is not true. That, that's how that's how you that's that's why you lost. Good day, sir. Have I ever cited the Bible in a climate change discussion or on Federal Reserve policy? Or is all I do pretty much all day long cite statistics on climate change and Federal Reserve policy? They, they, it's such a straw man that the left likes to set up. They don't like the arguments They're like, oh, you must be getting it from the Bible. Okay, first of all, I'll tell you when I'm getting the argument from the Bible. Perfectly fine with citing the Bible. I do it all the time in certain contexts. But the reality is that if you examine my show and you footnoted my show, it would have more facts on average per minute than pretty much any show on the air. All right. Okay.